Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Eurodell University. My name is Emil Kalinowski. I'm joined by Jeff Snyder, the head of global research for Alhambra Partners. And Jeff just wrote an article about the nomination, renomination of Jay Powell, Federal Reserve Chairman, for another four year term. We know the, what the financial media think of it, we know what the US Congress thinks of it. We're going to ask what the bond market thinks of it. We're going to look at yield curves. Uh, back in 2013, when something similar was happening, 2018, when something similar was happening, and right now, to try to get a sense of what the bond market thinks of it all. Jeff, uh, the, the chairman was renominated, and uh, I wonder why. Why was he renominated? Why not Lyell Brainerd? It was something of a surprise, or maybe not necessarily, I mean, it wasn't, certainly wasn't shocking, but it was something of a surprise because I think in the media, at least, there were all sorts of whispers and trial balloons floated about Lael Brainerd and several other names, potentially. And in some ways, it didn't seem like uh, Jay Powell had really all that much of a realistic chance, especially given how, the, how he was nominated by President Trump. And as every administration comes in following a previous administration, there's always this tendency to want to undo everything the other guy did and do your and put your own stamp on everything that's being done. I mean, that's that's how Jay Powell got nominated in the first place, right? I mean, for as far as President Trump was concerned back in 2017, Jay Powell was sort of the outsider. At least that was his reputation. That wasn't the, the truth or reality. But Powell was something different, at least different in appearance that Trump could point to for the public and say, well, I'm doing different things. I'm doing different things than the last guy did because that's sort of why I got elected in the first place. So you'd think that maybe Biden would, you know, I think that was probably the, the main uh, emphasis was that, you know, President Biden was going to do the same kind of thing, put his own person, whoever that might be, into the Federal Reserve chairmanship, because that's just kind of what, 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 what we do nowadays. Your blog post on the 22nd of November 2021, hashtag continuity, the least useful person. You tell us why you think, why you believe, with good reason, he was renominated, quote, what truly matters politically isn't inflation or even economy. Instead, they're all terrified of the Fed's true weapon. I wonder what it is, which isn't a money printer. It isn't even money. Rather, it is entirely stocks, equities, share prices. What do you mean? Well, think back to 2017. One of the reasons why President Trump felt confident enough economists that he was listening to felt confident enough to replace one-term Janet Yellen was because of globally synchronized growth, the tremendous boom in stocks that had started from the, basically the day Trump was elected all the way through to the renomination or the nomination process for Powell. So Trump realized he was on very solid ground that, hey, look, the economy seems to be doing really well. That's what everybody says. And the stock market is at record highs and going up at a near vertical angle. So it's okay. Maybe I can take a little bit of a risk because things seem to be going in the right direction. Everything seems to be very well. Contrast that with, say, Ben Bernanke's sort of renomination, everybody hold their nose in 2009, when it was, you know, the guy had just come off the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, but it was in the early stages of the recovery. The stock market was just starting to come back up. Things were still very, you know, the recovery period was very nascent. It was unsure. It was uncertain. And so hashtag continuity in 2009, nobody really wanted to rock the boat. The last thing that anybody in President Obama's administration wanted to do was to upset what was a very delicate situation. So 2017, things seemed to be rock solid, at least politically, therefore change from Yellen to Powell. 2009, for example, uh, ben Bernanke in the midst of crisis, better keep everything the same because we don't know what would happen if we don't. Now, you just mentioned stocks was the reason that was uh, the President Trump nominated uh, someone new because that was a signal that everything was well. And I think some people may say that you're being rude, that he would be so, uh, so shallow, that you're being rude towards orange people. But it's not true. You're not just making this up, Jeff. On the council, the President's Council of Economic Advisors that that group, I forgot the exact uh, name for that thing is, but they had two things for forever on their website. At the headline was, the economy is killing it right now because the unemployment rate is down and stocks are up. So you're not 
being unfair. That was the headline for the Trump administration. But the Obama administration, it seems like, or at least, I don't know if it was the Obama administration, but it was just the sense of it. The same with Bernanke. Here, let me read a quote from August 24th, 2009. Reuters, there has been a considerable amount of speculation in the marketplace, both in the market and among observers of the Fed. And going into the fall, the president wanted to end that speculation. That who, who said that? Austin Goldsby, a member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Got it. I wish that's who I was referring to either earlier. He told that to Reuters television. And then later in the Reuters article, U.S. stocks were slightly higher in the afternoon trading, buoyed, buoyed by news of Bernanke's nomination. Stocks, stocks, stocks. It's always stocks, right? And look, oh. even, even in the public perception, we're told pretty much from the very beginning, we're all taught from first economics class on through and, and the message reinforced in all the financial media that we're supposed to take our cues about our global economic situation from Wall Street, from the stock market. Well, we are supposed to take it from Wall Street. It's just that Wall Street, the your Wall Street that actually matters isn't equities and the New York Stock Exchange and share prices, it's something else entirely. But the public believes that, hey, if the shares are up, um, then things must be doing well, which is interesting recalling our conversation last week with Russell Napier, when he said that, you know, when he correctly pointed out this, this situation is unique to the United States. In other places around the world, share prices don't react in the way they do here. In fact, they reflect more of reality, especially in Asian countries. You know, we were talking about the Asian financial crisis and its aftermath. You know, share prices don't just bounce up all the time like they do in America. And so maybe around some parts of the rest of the world, we can take stocks somewhat closer to their face value. But that hasn't been the case in the United States for a very long time. But you can see why political perception would prioritize the stock market signal because if politicians believe that the public believes everything is about stock prices, then the last thing you want to do is rock the share price boat. If politicians want to manage expectations and provide a hopeful uh, message, then of course they're going to point to the stock market, which generally is rising. But we've known for years, decades, generations now that the stock market, at least in the United States, doesn't ever predict recessions or anything like that. What does? the bond market, when the yield curve inverts. So it's not Wall Street we need to look at, it's Wall Street and Lombard Street and West Bay Road in the Cayman Islands, where bond market activity is taking place. That's where we're gonna to turn to next, ladies and gentlemen. You know, Jeff and I are just a couple of old cranks. Who cares what we think? <laughs> Big deal, Jay Powell, we don't like his renomination. What about the largest bond, well, largest market on planet Earth. What does this collective co complex system think of his nomination? Let's go to the yield curve and find out. We're going to be looking at a new article now. Sorry, Jay. Curves, hashtag continuity, is not a good thing. November 23rd, 2021. And we're going to be looking at a U.S. Treasury yield curve. We're not going to be looking at the one from right now, though, at least not right away. Oh, I guess we are. But the, the emphasis is on the 2013 yield curve as of November 20th. I need glasses. What was happening in that time? Larger, right? yeah, yeah. You know, that, that, that's, you know, if, if the market was saying that, you know, stocks were right about the, uh, the, the bond market was agreeing with the stock market or the general perception about inflation, growth expectations and things like that, we would have seen the yield curve continue its rise and steepening from earlier in the year not pausing around mid-March and continue upward so that it would at least have resembled the 2013 yield curve as a start. And then we would expect it to continue because as we know, as steep as the 2013 yield curve got, it was not representative of actual recovery and growth and inflation expectations because those things didn't happen. So even 2013's relatively far steeper curve was still minimal in its perception of growth and, expect and inflation expectations. In fact, when we map out these yield curves and put them together with historical examples, the current curve as of today is more like the yield curve had been in August of 2019 than anything of 2013 or better. And if you remember August of 2019, Emil, what was going on in August of 2019? You started out this segment by referring to it. That was inversion. We that was the recession scare. That, the shape of the yield curve, especially at the long end, of the, uh, long end of it, right now today, 
with taper on the table, with inflation and CPIs and everybody going crazy about these things, the yield curve today resembles August of 2019 almost identically in the in sort of the middle to the back end than anything like 2013 or even 2018. Okay, let's go a little bit one at a time. So we just talked about the 2013 taper. It's called tantrum, but it was a celebration. The yield curve steep, and it's that thick orange line that the audience can see on their screen right now. Opportunity at the long end, economic opportunity and return. Great, yes. super. Why would you buy safe liquid assets when everything's going to be awesome in the future? So regardless of what the Fed's doing, we don't want to own safe and liquid because the future is going to be much better. There's nominal opportunities in the real economy. We don't want to own treasuries or GSE debt or something like that. We want something more risky. That's the steepening of the yield curve at the long end. That's Irving Fisher's growth and in inflation expectations embedded in, in the yields. And that's what the curve should change toward if the economy is moving in the right direction. But not just stopping where it was in 2013, but going further and further, steeper, steeper, rising nominal rates. Now, let's, let's move forward. That was, the, that was a celebration, economic hope. We're out of this shock, these two shocks that we were in. Unfortunately, we ran into euro dollar number three, the reserve currency crisis out of in foreign exchange reserves crisis in China, uh, emerging market currencies, the U.S. dollar rising, oil plunging. So we had a we had a reset. We were set back. Then in 2018, 2017, 2016, we had something globally synchronized growth. Our next, our last big reflation, our hope relatively big. And now we're looking at a graph that represents economic opportunity at the height of this last reflationary recovery, 2018. And I'm looking, Jeff, and it didn't really get up as high as the 2013 number, did it? The long end. No, the steepening was less. And it was, you know, it was one of those things where you say, you know, what's going on here? Why is it? Because globally synchronized growth, at least the rhetoric around the inflation and economic opportunity in 2017, 2018, was even more overheated and even more assured than it had been in 2013 and 2014. Yet the yield curves were flatter and stunter, smaller, shriveled, whatever, you, however you want to characterize them, which was the market saying as little as we bought economic growth and inflation the last time around a couple of years ago, we buy it even less in 2018 than we had before. And of course, as we've done on this show many, many times, we've gone through all the reasons in 2018 why that was, including the fact the economy really wasn't doing all that well, but also all the deflationary potential embedded in what was the nascent euro dollar number four, which was, you know, collateral squeezes, general monetary tightness throughout the global euro dollar system. So as far as the yield curve was concerned, 2018 in the globally synchronized growth was less convincing than 2013 had been. We're moving forward now to present day. We had two episodes of recovery, the taper celebration, globally synchronized growth. And then we had the reopening boom, the helicopter money drops from Uncle Sam, takeoff, vaccines. And so now we're looking at another chart. We've got three dates here, three curves. March 19th, 2021, October 21st, 2021, and just the other day, November 22nd, 2021. Jeff, let me guess, was March 19th. That was the peak, the steepest, the highest the yield curve got before things started going the other way. And, and then what happened in October and where is November today relative to March this year and 2018 and 2013? You're right. March, mid-March, and late March of this year, that was sort of the peak of whatever reflation we got. And you're right. Everything from basically November, December, January seemed to be going the right way. Not only did we have, as you pointed out, we had vaccines, therefore a potential end to the pandemic in sight. We had economic growth and recovery, at least the appearance of those things all around the world. Everything seemed to be coming back up at the same time, sort of a globally synchronized rebound. Plus we had, as you pointed out also, massive doses of quote unquote stimulus in the United States in the form of direct helicopter payments, but also, you know, fiscal and monetary programs all over the world in sizes and scales that we have never, ever seen before. So, you know, November, January, February seemed to be everything that possibly could go right was going right, except 
in the bond market. In the bond market, you had the yield curve that did steepen, that did, you know, nominal rates did rise, but nowhere near even 2018, let alone something like 2013. In fact, it was so small and it was almost insignificant. Yet that doesn't seem to compute with everything going right, unless you realize the bond market is telling you that it seemed like everything going right, but not everything was actually going right. In fact, there were other problems and other factors that we needed to take into account that this massive, sophisticated market was taking account and telling us what its perception of those things were, and they were not good. And so the yield curve shape over the last, what is it now, um, over eight months, eight months has basically been unchanged. The most recent peak in, uh, steepness uh, in the yield curve was October 21st, which was a little bit less than, the, than it had been, except in the front end of the curve. Now we see the front end of the curve start to ship, shift upward, which is a reflection of what Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve are likely to do next year. And then the back end of the curve, which is saying, these guys have it all wrong. They're going to taper. They're going to do rate hikes. But that's not going to be because there's growth in inflation, because there is no growth in inflation. So like 2018, since around March, we've seen not only the, we've seen the particular part of the yield curve, the five-year, 10-year spread has flattened noticeably, which is an indication that the bond market is rejecting the growth and inflation story behind the Fed's taper and eventual rate hike. And Mr. Powell's renomination that anything's going to change. We have yes, seen... hashtag continuity because that, that's going to continue too, right? This bond market skepticism is actually even more robust after his renomination because the curve is as flat as it's been in that all important five to 10 year space. It's as flat as it's been since May of last year, May of 2020. That's how flat that part of the curve has gotten. Wow. May of 2020, we were getting out of the worst of it. That was the low point, or maybe April was, but that was an awful time. So yeah, if you want, the other way to look at it is it's as flat as it was been, as it was in early 2018 or the middle part of 2018, which is, that's not a very good comparison either, especially because in the middle of 2018, both the curves are moving in the same direction, which means in 2021, we're seeing the curve flatten just like we had in 2018. So we're moving in that same direction, which is not the good direction. You've written about this before, ratcheting. We have seen the U.S. Treasury yield curve and euro dollar futures ratcheting down with each reflation. The 2013 best shaped yield curve was worse than the one we saw in 2009. The 2018 globally synchronized growth was worse than 2013's peak. And now here we are in 2021, it's worse than what we saw in 2018. And you, you summarize the article saying, in other words, the best and most historically validated inflation slash growth measure humans currently have available. The one thing to rely on in lieu of discovering some infallible crystal ball, this indicator is actually behaving today with even more, is even more skeptical of Jay's mainstream inflation fantasy than it had been, correctly remember, three years ago. Jeff, we, I know what some of the audience members are saying, including members of the media that are watching this right now and the administration, and they are saying, the bond market, look at those two old cranks still going, talking about the bond market, like it's not been manipulated and addled and can put under the control and assimilated by the Borg that is the Federal Reserve. In part two of this episode, we are going to address that question. Is the treasury market under control of the Federal Reserve? Can we rely on it? Does QE control what's happening with yields? We're gonna talk about that next.